Hey guys welcome back to the channel this is a story about what if Deku had an incredible quirk part 1. If you guys enjoy this what if and want to see part 2 comment down below and let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel and also share this video with your friends and check out the description in my playlist. The author of the story Jax is Tharn from Ao 3. So let's start the video. Hawkman Final Flight Issue 5 Moonlight bathed New York in its glow as he flew wings pumping with everything he had and catching as many thermals as he could while swerving between the towers that filled the skyline. Years before Carter knew he wouldn't be doing this alone. Years before Carter would have had the others. He gave another pump of his wings as he flew along, catching a thermal to help him speed up, reminiscing on when it all went wrong. When McCarthy began pointing fingers, when Director Hoover made his ultimatum to him and the rest of the Justice Society, and Mass can submit to the U.S. government and therefore, Hoover, or face the consequences. Oh, he wrapped it up all prettily with a thank you for your service and all you did during the war. But the chains were there, Carter could see them, so could the others. So Carter called his bluff. J. Edgar Hoover didn't bluff. The bat was murdered by unknown individuals. Their identities were compromised. Agents of a new government task force arrested them in their homes and places of work, brought them up on false charges and convictions that would have made Carter laugh in another life if they didn't stick. They dragged Kent out of his home in a straitjacket in front of his wife and daughter before throwing him into a mental hospital. Wesley and Jim were in prison for evidence tampering, a charge made worse for Jim due to him being a police detective. Alan, they claimed was a communist spy and outed him as a homosexual, destroying his reputation as his broadcast network was shut down. Al was hauled away during a physics lecture he was teaching on charges of assaulting multiple officers along with conspiracy against the United States. Dinah was nabbed when she was walking home from the club she sang at for mass destruction of property. They grabbed Abigail at the same time from the grocery store she ran pulled her out from the back kitchen still in her apron under the charges of aiding and abetting. Sylvester and Charles were both publicly arrested for supposed embezzlement from their own companies along with insider trading and theft of intellectual property. And Terry and Rex, two dear friends and founding members, were gunned down on the street for supposedly fleeing officers. With Ted, he was found beaten to death in an alleyway alongside Johnny. All four members executed to thunderous applause. As for Jay, the Flash would never run again, Checkmate made sure of that. He was the only one who actually escaped the initial charges against them, and checkmate agents entered his home in the middle of the night and broke his legs, as if they were mobsters collecting a late loan. And Shara, his Shara, his beloved wife, murdered on the court steps when she and Carter were leaving after their joint trial. A bullet through her temple as blood pooled down the steps. Polly and Jor were both right. The Age of Heroes was dead, and they were murdered by those they swore to protect. Both of them left the world of man and mortals after the trials, Polly returning to the Masira and its mystical protections, and Jor flying off in his ship back to Krypton. Wonder Woman and Powerman, they were gone. Carter bade the two farewells before locking himself up in the society's brownstone, wishing nothing more than to die and let what happened be nothing more than a nightmare. And for death he waited, his joints began to ache. His fingers curled, wrinkles crawled across him, his once dark brown hair grayed, leaving only a few flecks of copper in it. And through all that, Carter mourned. He mourned the loss of his friends, the loss of his wife. He could barely leave his bed some days due to his sorrow. And then she came. A young girl, blonde and brown-eyed and begging for help. Her name was Chloe Sullivan. Through apparently meticulous research as a reporter, Ms. Sullivan had seemingly stumbled upon a series of arrests made by Hoover and his men back in the 50 seconds that didn't seem to add up. Missing witnesses, evidence tampering, the fact that all of them were taking the fall for the others, she decided to track down those who remained from this apparent group of criminals to find out the truth behind their arrest. It was how she met Sylvester, kind-hearted and joyful Sylvester who told her about them. All of him, all we want is justice MS. Sullivan, his last words before Sylvester was murdered by an unseen figure. Realizing that his former teammates were in danger, Chloe began to search for them before this mysterious killer caught up to them. Now Sylvester was dead, as were Wesley and Kent too. All of them murdered by a man wielding daggers of ice. Jormockant was supposed to be dead. Carter caved in the skull of Icicle with his mace when they had no other option left. It turns out he spawned before he died. And it was to the Chrysler building Carter Hall flew towards. Chloe was in danger, and Cameron Mockant was after her. Closing in on the tower, Carter saw a beam of cyan energy shoot into the air, followed by a surge of blue that was far too familiar for his liking. Carter readied his mace, the NTH metal humming as he shot down towards where the blast came from. He could see them through the window, Chloe on the ground. The revolver she was using to defend herself was frozen to the floor, and the ice-covered form of Cameron Mockant standing over her with an icicle. He stabbed downwards as Carter gave one more pump of his wings and swung forward with his mace. 
the weapon starting to crackle with energy as it smashed through the window and momentum causing Carter to fly into Icicle, fist first. This was for Sylvester, for Wesley, and for Kent. He caught Mockant in the ribs, cracking the ice armor he had formed and not giving him a chance to recover as he spun, bringing his mace crashing down on the shield Mockant had formed. Mockant quickly formed an icicle and tried to stab him with it, only for Carter to dodge the lousy attempt to harm him, pinning Mockant's arm between his own arm and torso and holding it still. Carter growled as he could immediately feel the cold radiating off of Mockant and starting to burn him. Mockant quickly used his free hand to form another icicle and stab downwards. He grabbed the bastard's wrist and nearly howled as he felt the cold through his gauntlet before headbutting Mockant and cracking the ice on his head. Mockant's stumble was all he needed as he swung his mace, the head striking Mockant's knee and sending him crashing downward with a scream. A single punch to the jaw silenced his screaming before Carter swung his mace with both hands and every ounce of fury he could muster. The mace collided with Mockin's chest, sending him flying back into a wall with a thunderous crash, an impact crater appearing as Mockin collapsed to the floor, his armor crumbling around him. Carter looked back over to Chloe as she was starting to move. You okay kid? Not at all, my head really hurts. Plus there was that guy with the knife. Carter froze at that. What guy? Chloe pushed herself up, Carter helping her to her feet. Her eyes widened as she looked behind him in shock. Him. She pointed with a shaking hand as a familiar purple-clad figure stepped out of the hallway. A slight chuckle with a southern drawl as he swung his walking stick back and forth. My dear Mr. Hawk, I do think those eyes of yours are starting to fail if you couldn't even see me, or the rest of us. Gambler grinned as he pointed his walking stick over to a corner, where the shadows in the room suddenly seemed to lunge and rip apart revealing the others. The Shade, the master of night and shadows, clad in his familiar Victorian gentleman's attire. Brainwave, the most powerful telepath and telekinetic in existence, his diminutive frame practically being swallowed by his green robes, his goggles glinting as he practically vibrated in excitement, and the last of them, possibly the biggest thorn in Carter's side since he made his debut, wearing his old magician costume and one nowhere in sight, the wizard, one of the most powerful magicians that the Justice Society had faced. Hello Carter, you, you bastard, I should have figured you were involved in this somehow. Couldn't kill us in our prime so you wait till we're old and the fight's left us. Carter prepped his mace while blocking Chloe this was a bad idea on your part Zard, especially by involving her in this. Wizard merely raised his hands as he took a step forward, his eyes never leaving Carter. I do apologize for us having to use Ms. Sullivan here, but it was necessary to lure you from your nest. He gave a smile, a disarming tactic, one he had tried to use in the past. You look tired, downtrodden even. Time is never kind to those who suffer from heartbreak. What do you want, Zard? Wizard dropped his smile, his eyes mournful for a brief moment as he looked at Carter. The years had not been kind to William. His shoulders had a slump to them they didn't before and there was an air of tiredness that surrounded him. Perdigatin hasn't been seen since the war ended, rivals dead at the hands of Checkmate. Same with Sportsmaster and Tigress. The Soviets killed Red Lantern. And someone else killed Dragon King. Eclipso vanished off to God knows where and Savage seems to have dropped off the face to the earth while Grundy went back to his swamp. Your Justice Society were not the only casualties of Hoover and McCarthy's little temper tantrum and crusade. And him, Carter gestured over to Icicle, who was being pulled to his feet by Gambler and glaring at him. Why kill the others? You killed my dad, right? Cameron smirked. Seems only fair that you dropped dead as well. To be fair, Carter, we only found young Cameron after he murdered Kent Nelson. And as much as I would have liked to see all the former Justice Society dead or out of the picture, we are something of an endangered species. Zard lightly pushed Icicle to the back of their group. I want to offer something to you Carter, a chance for retribution, and while Mr. Mockett may have irrevocably destroyed any possible chance we would have at allying with each other, I still wish to put the offer forward. Carter watched as the wizard held out his hand, hoping Carter would take it. Like I said, we are a dying breed, you and me, and I believe together, we can accomplish wonders. We can take it back, all of it, our pride and dignity that were stolen by them. Your Justice Society were some of the most powerful individuals in the world at their height, and they were betrayed, you were betrayed, by those you swore to protect. They tarnished you, damaged you, murdered you, they hate you Carter. They hate everyone like us. If every magic user, metahuman, or tech wielder dropped dead tomorrow then the masses would cheer in the streets and yell good riddance. Maybe in a different time your team could have survived, but not this time. Even when you served them, they made you operate from the shadows, as if you were something to be ashamed of, I would see us, all of us stepping into the light, as the new masters of the world. The wizard grinned at Carter. So, what do you say Hawkman, do you wish for a little retribution? He froze at that. He did. He wanted it since share as blood pooled under her as her heart stopped. But retribution on who though? McCarthy drank himself into the grave. And Hoover's black heart gave out, there was no one left. Why conquer the world's art? Miss Sullivan is going to reveal our story. 
get us the justice we deserve. At that, his eyes narrowed. Ah yes, Chloe Sullivan, I have read your work dear and you would have made an amazing reporter. Unfortunately, I know people like you won't be able to keep your mouth shut and your expose about us would get myself, my comrades, and the remaining Justice Society killed. A flick of his wrist caused his wand to appear as he pointed it at Chloe. So, it is with my deepest regrets Ms. Sullivan, that for us to live, you have to die. His wand began to crackle with arcane energy as it fired off a blue beam, only to miss as Carter burst forward with a punch, knocking Wizard off target and blowing a hole in the wall behind Chloe. Kid run. Carter readied his mace as a flick of his wrist caused his shield to spring forth. He planted his feet as he looked to the remaining members of the Injustice Society. None of them could leave here alive. If they did, they would hunt Chloe, they would kill the Justice Society, and Carter couldn't let that happen. He could hear Chloe's shoes clacking against the tile as she raced towards the door, his eyes never leaving the villains before him. The wizard let out a sigh. I suppose it was too much to hope our war would end here tonight. He raised his wand again. You know you will die if you do this, right Carter? I know. Carter crouched as he looked to the five before him still though. Better to go out on my feet protecting at least one more. Well then, he gave a flourish of his cape and struck his signature dueling pose. Once more for old time's sake Hawkman. A flick of his wand caused a blue arcane bolt to fire towards Carter, dissipating on his shield as Carter raced forward with Icicle doing the same. Carter quickly lashed out with his shield, the edge catching Mockin in the head with a loud crack as he crumpled to the ground. Carter quickly turned towards Wizard, only for him to stumble as he felt the sensation of an axe digging into his brain. Turning to the source he saw Brainwave with his hands to his temples as he unleashed his sonic attack. Carter pulled his wings back and pushed forward, the gust of wind knocking Brainwave off balance long enough for him to rush the diminutive man and bring his mace down upon his skull. Bone cracked and caved as Brainwave dropped to the ground, blood pooling under him. Crack. Carter stumbled forward while dropping his mace as a bullet from Gambler's Deringer dug into his back. The shadows warped around him to grip him in place as Gambler pulled out his knife, his pistol coming up for another shot. Time to fold Hawkman. Gambler fired just as Carter managed to raise his shield just enough to block the bullet, the round shattering and slicing into him distracting him long enough for Gambler to lunge forward with his stiletto knife, the blade stabbing him in the side as Carter roared in pain before headbutting Gambler, his helm letting out a clang as Gambler's nose fragmented under the NTH metal sending him stumbling back and dropping his dagger. The knife embedding itself in the floor while Carter dropped to his knees due to Shade's hold. Carter quickly grabbed the knife and with a flick of his wrist it flew forward, the blade embedding itself into Shade's chest as he stumbled back in surprise. The shadows holding Carter dissipating as he pushed himself to his feet and swung a fist. The gauntlet slamming into Shade's face as his head swung back with a crack before his body dropped limply, his neck at an angle. A slice to the side from one of Gambler's throwing knives brought his attention to the purple-clad villain as he grabbed his hair and yanked him off balance. Quickly bringing up a leg and stomping downward rewarded Carter with an audible crack and scream as Gambler crashed to the ground on his broken leg. Carter quickly straddled the body and gripped his blood-drenched head, causing Gambler to scream as Carter's fingers dug into his skull and his thumbs burrowed into his eyes. Carter pulled Gambler's head towards him and slammed it down on the floor while Gambler clawed at his face with spindly fingers that dug in. Carter bashed Gambler's head to the ground a second time before giving it a wrench to the side to throw him off balance before punching Gambler again in the face as he began to gurgle blood before reaching around frantically for anything thing that could help him. His grasping hand gripping onto one of the bars on the observation deck, ripping the bar backward pulled it free from its wall mounts as Carter stabbed the bar down, impaling Gambler through the chest and even going into the floor. Gambler stilled, his arms dropping as Carter stood and turned towards Wizard as an arcane bolt slammed into his abdomen, charring his skin and throwing him back. Looking up at Zard, he saw the man looking on in horror with wild eyes. You could have killed us at any time, couldn't you? All of our fights before, you were holding back. Carter let out a grin, blood staining his teeth. He must have looked like a monster. Had I gone out, you all would have been dead a long time ago, Zard. But I wanted to play by the rules of this age, by the rules of an age of heroes. So, I pulled my punches and held back as much as I could, figuring I could bring you to justice on their terms instead of mine. Carter reached to his hip and pulled out a curved dagger of NTH metal. Now, I have no one left. Those who could have held me back are long gone or long buried, as you and your people will be. Carter charged as Wizard began firing of bolts and spells from his wand each one either dissipating on the NTH metal or slamming into Carter. The regenerative properties of his armor were working overtime as each impact made its mark. Cuts, slashes, bludgeoning pain, even burns were starting to heal up. Carter roared as he swung his dagger, the weapon cutting through the hastily erected shield wizard had conjured up and slicing through his fingers, his hand, and his wand. The two pieces and severed parts of his hand fell to the floor as wizard held his wounded hand to his chest, blood soaking his magician's coat. 
He let out a laugh. So, you would kill all of us then? You would end all of us for one person? You are far more like us than you could imagine Hawkman. Wizard looked up at him. So go ahead, end it. Carter put a hand on Wizard's shoulder. I never take any pleasure in killing people William. Not even if they were my enemy. Carter's arm flew as his dagger sliced across Sard's throat. Blood pouring down his neck as Carter laid him down, sheathing his wings as he did so. Our time will come again. Maybe not this life but the next. Carter stood up and turned, only to be impaled in the abdomen by a dagger of ice. And a snarling Cameron Mockett standing in front of him with blood running down his temple into his eye. You bastard. He pulled the ice dagger out and stabbed it in again. And again, and again stabbing Carter, pushing him up against the wall as he slumped to the ground. Icicle cackled as he formed an ice blade and put it against Carter's throat. Now you get to die you fucking bird. But that won't be all of them. No, maybe I'll pay a visit to Jay Garrick, see how far he can get with a cane and hobbled legs. Carter reached with a blood-coated hand, his mace out of reach. Oh, better yet, I'll go for Alan Scott, or that bitch Abigail. I'll pay all of them a visit so they can see what a true cold-hearted bastard can do. A loud bang sounded through the air as Icicle dropped his blade and stumbled. Part of his skull flew from his head due to the bullet as he lurched to the side and hit the ground. Chloe stepped forward, Gambler's Deringer held in shaking hands. Another crack rang out as she fired again, the second bullet ripping through his chest. The final shot that was fired was Gambler's ammonia round, the gas melting his ice and burning his skin as Icicle cried out in pain. Chloe dropped the Deringer and picked up the closest object to her, Carter's mace, letting out a feral scream. Chloe slammed the mace down on Mockin's head crushing it under the blow and causing the body of the second icicle to shatter into flakes of ice. Chloe stood still, breathing heavily as she dropped the mace and ran to Carter. Mr. Hull. Mr. Hull. Carter was finding it more difficult to breathe. A coldness that he was far too familiar with creeped along his body. Carter please hang on I'll. Carter gripped Chloe's arm as she stopped. He knew he was dying, and so did she. Sint, stay. Chloe nodded as she kneeled down next to him. Oh, we, want, is, justice. He looked up at Chloe, the world growing dark. Tell, everything, the, good, and the bad. Let them judge, for we cannot. The coldness was crawling through him more and more. Please. Chloe nodded yes, starting to tear up. Carter smiled one last time, drooped his head, and exhaled for the last time. Hawkman, rebirth, issue one the sun was starting to rise over Musutafu as Izuku Midoriya sat on his favorite bench, sketchbook in hand as he was working on his newest drawing of his friend. Most of the other kids, and several of the adults, would be laughing at him when he would try to explain his friends. They weren't imaginary like he thought everyone else thought. He knew they were real, or at least as real as they could be to the only person who could see them. A creaking noise and a slight huff alerted him that someone was sitting on the bench next to him while he worked on his design. He had another one of his odd dreams last night and one of his friends was wearing a different costume. He wanted to make sure he got it sketched down to show them and get their opinion on it. I have to admit, this is one of the better ones. Izuku smiled as he continued to work on the sketch in his special book, his friend looking over at the sketchbook. To be honest kid, I forgot I even wore that old suit. Why do you say that? Izuku asked as he began the lightning bolt outline on the coat. His friend leaned back against the bench, arms stretched out and relaxed. Well, I only wore it a few times, and all of those times were at night. Is that why the bolt is just an outline instead of filled in? Yeah, it was meant for night missions, or for nighttime runs. That actually did explain the darker colors used in it. Izuku looked over at his friend. Jay was smiling as usual, wearing the red sweater and blue jean combo he would most often see in his dreams, the silver of his kettle helmet shining along with its golden wings while his winged boots were slightly scuffed. So why add goggles with this suit? Jay would often go maskless or with a simple cloth mask for when he had to stand still. I figured that for night missions I should take a page out of Charles or Elliot's books and have darker eye protection. I will not be making that mistake again. Yeah, the goggles do look weird. Jay let out a booming laugh at that as he patted Izuku on the back. I know. Now don't you have to get to school, kid? Izuku blinked and checked his watch. I'm going to be late. He quickly closed his sketchbook and packed up his bag before running off down the street. A loud boom quickly drew his attention to a nearby fight, checking his watch again. Izuku saw he had time before pulling out his hero analysis notebook and began to write and sketch. Check it out. It's death arms. The punching hero in question quickly caught a nearby metal tower thrown at him. Izuku quickly sneaked through the crowd as a group of girls began to scream in joy. Izuku quickly covered his ears at that. One of the few oddities about him was the enhanced hearing he had. And that was before he started seeing people that others couldn't. Looking up he saw Kamui Woods leap through the air and onto the scene and begin fighting the villain in front of him. Illegal use of powers during rush hour and robbery resulting in bodily injury. You are the incarnation of evil. Kamui taunted. Izuku however frowned at the taunt, the man next to him snarling and cracking his knuckles. 
If this twig thinks that a damn purse snatcher is the incarnation of evil, he'd be dead before he entered the battlefield. I've seen evil before, and that ain't it. The man continued to glare at Kamui, clad in his pitch black cat suit, his cowl pulled back revealing the scars on his face from past fights and his slightly crooked nose. I know Ted, I know. Kamui quickly shot up and into the fight, flinging his arms forward. Preemptive binding lacquered chain prison. Both he and Izuku shouted as Roots sprung forward to tie up the villain before them. Canyon Cannon A massive foot launched forward and collided with the villain, causing him to fly back and slammed into a nearby wall, cratering the wall and ending the fight. The giantess in question turned to reporters before giving a smile. Today is the day of my debut. My name is Mount Lady. A pleasure to make your ass acquaintance, she said before sticking out her rear as the camera started flashing. Izuku, I know I told you there are times where I am glad that I am blind. I believe that this would be one of them. Izuku looked to see Ted gone. In his place was Charles, clad in his tunic, googles, cowl, and rounded cape. A goddamn disgrace is what it is. Looking to his right, Izuku saw Dinah in her leather jacket and fishnets. Her domino mask unable to cover the fact her eyebrows were raised, along with that, Izuku saw her practically snarling. She was pissed. Shira, Polly, and I fought tooth and nail to be taken seriously by anyone outside the mask community and our own allies. Glad to see all of our efforts wasted by. Oh come on. She threw her hands up as more people began crowding around Mount Lady with the other heroes looking on. I would suggest you hurry to school Izuku. Dinah will be like this for a while. Even Izuku knew she would. Thanks Charles, bye Dinah. The heroine in question turned to Izuku and gave him a soft smile and salute. See you soon kid. The two of them faded away as Izuku quickly ran once more to Aldera, arriving with only minutes to spare and reaching his desk, pausing and sighing as he saw the kanji for no written on it. At least it wasn't spider lilies again. Quickly pulling out a bottle and sponge, Izuku quickly sprayed and scrubbed the writing off his desk before sitting down. The door creaked open on its rusty hinges as their sensei entered and they began the class. Now students, since you're all in your last year of middle school, I suggest it's time you think about your future, which is why I brought these. Sensei, and he used that term lightly with the man before them, held up the career path handouts to the majority of the class groaning. Izuku put down his pen and prepared to cover his ears. But you all plan on going into heroics anyway. He threw the handouts up in the air while Izuku clamped his hands down over his ears as the class roared in approval, quirks flying across the room as riotous students cheered. All right, all right, just remember using your powers at school is against the rules. Teach, don't lump us in the same group. I'm not gonna be stuck at the bottom with the rest of these rejects. Katsuki yelled out with a jagged grin as everyone began to yell back at him. That's right, you applied to you. But if I remember correctly, Bakugu, Sensei's grin was oily. And that was Izuku putting it nicely. Damn straight, I eased the mock test. He kicked back his chair and hopped up on his desk. I'll be the only student at this crappy school that gets in. The rest of you extras I'll just grind beneath my boot. I'll surpass Hawks, Endeavor, and even All Might as the top hero in the world. And that's good to hear back you go. Oh, Midoriya, you also applied to Yua as well, correct? The class went quiet as they looked at Izuku, who tried to shrink in his seat. The no applied. He is pretty strong. I once saw him lift a desk one-handed. Anyone could do that. It was Sensei's desk. He's so creepy though. 3. Is he looking at me? Those eyes, they pierce your soul. 2. What's a null supposed to do at UA? Jump. It is the right height. 1. D-A-K-U. There it is. Izuku looked over to Katsuki. The blonde had smoke coming off of him along with small pops from his quirk. What the fuck are you doing? Applying to UA. Q-U-I-R-K-L-E-S-S can't apply there. Izuku merely sighed before sitting up and looking towards the blonde bomber. One eye on him, the rest on the room to prevent someone else from trying something. I would think Katsuki. He flinched at the bite in Izuku's tone. That someone who aced UAS mock test would be well aware of the rules that the school would have, such as how Principal Nezu repealed the ban on quirkless students last year, as well as said Principal's strong stance against the old MLA slurs that just about everyone else in here casually throw around. He was so getting beat up today, it'd be worth it though. Especially after what happened with Tsubasa when they were kids. He could still smell cooking flesh and hear his cries. They would overlap with some of the worst of the nightmares. Katsuki merely snarled and slammed his hands on Izuku's desk, charring the surface. He'd have to clean that as well. Do you need another reminder of your place Deku? His breath was hot. A slight scent of spices could be detected in the air as he glared at Izuku. I don't know Katsuki. You still haven't given me a bouquet yet. One thing that everyone who had left spider lilies on his desk had done was leave a signed note with them. All notes were kept in a safe space as evidence. The only one who hadn't done so was the Pomeranian. He just chose to burn him with his quirk. Katsuki flinched slightly at that before tensing to leap at him. 
Midoriya that's enough. Honestly always causing trouble. It's a surprise you're still enrolled with all of the disturbances you cause. Katsuki smirked and returned to his seat while Izuku pulled out his analysis book and got to work again. Classes ended a couple hours later with everyone leaving except for Izuku who was still packing up and cleaning his desk of its new burns. Did I ever say how much I hate your teacher kid? Izuku looked up to see Al. Clad in his yellow and blue suit, the full cowl not offering much expression on his face as his cape slightly fluttered in a non-existent breeze. You did, I know you did. Numerous times now that I think about it. Yeah well, the bastard crossed a line today. You can't give out a student's private information like that. I know Al, just as how I know that not a single thing will be done about it, and I haven't even gotten into his teaching style yet. He's an idiot. Between you, Terry, and Rex I'll be fine. Just need to make sure I dumb myself down enough for the rest of Aldera and stay quiet. Trust me kid, you'll be taking the lead soon enough. You'll see. Izuku looked up to see Al was gone and he was alone. A crash of wood on cement from the door slamming open however, proved that was no longer the case as Bakugu and several others stepped in, closing the door behind them. Deku, Bakugu began. I'm going to give you one chance right here and now. Retract your application to UA or else. Izuku felt a pressure in his mind as an image of a man with a receding hairline appeared in his mind briefly, stating something similar. Out of everyone in this shitty school, I'm the only one who will get into UA as a rising underdog. A perfect origin story for the next greatest hero. Izuku finished packing, reaching for his hero analysis book, only for it to be grabbed by Ayubai, who snatched it up by extending his fingers and plucking it up. Hey check this out. He began flipping through the pages and reading. This is your plan to get into UA, by creeping on the other students. Well, that doesn't sound very heroic. Ishkin's grin was dark, rocks forming over his hands. It sounds more villainous if you ask me. Gathering up everyone's weaknesses to use against them. It's a hobby of mine, and it's meant to help people improve their skills. Waduo Rien help. Hacho's underbite always made it difficult to understand him. It means he thinks you extras are idiots. Katsuki smirked as he calmly explained it. That's not even close Kakin. Everyone always has room to improve and better themselves. You think I quote him weak? Did I say that? The room was silent. Just give me back my notebook Katsuki and leave. Bakugu was still at that, close to snarling. He held out his hand and Ayubai passed him the book. The blonde took a look at it, glanced at Izuku, and slammed his hands over the book with an explosion detonating between them, leaving his work a charred mess. You don't ever tell me what to do Deku. He tossed the book out the window and stepped forward and put his hand on Izuku's shoulder before activating his quirk. Izuku clenched his teeth as he glared at Bakugu, refusing to break eye contact as the scent of charred flesh began to fill the room. He stared into Katsuki's eyes. He could see the rage in them, the hatred. It was far too familiar to one of the people from his dreams. Hey Bakugu, I think he's had enough now. Ayubai was sounding nervous as he looked on. The rest of Bakugu's little gang looking on as well, none of them wanting anyone to come in. Remove your hand or I'll break it again Katsuki. He wasn't bluffing. He did it once before when Bakugu charred Tsubasa. That was the last time he had ever felt that angry. Katsuki pulled his hand back and fired off a blast next to Izuku's ear, causing him to stumble back at the spearing pain of the loud sound. Retract your admission to you. Everyone knows a quirkless can't be a hero. Izuku smirked, he knew otherwise. Bakugu began to walk away with his cronies but not before stopping and looking back. If you want a quirk so bad Deku, then take a swan dive off the roof and pray for one in your next life. He laughed before exiting the room with his followers. Izuku stood there, speechless, he was in shock. Kid, he never thought Bakugo would join in with the baiting. The blonde was a bastard yes, but he never thought he would go that far. There were certain lines you were never supposed to cross and if you did, well, that was something that you couldn't forgive and forget. It would stick with you forever, it would stain them forever as well. Izuku was starting to find it difficult to breathe as he grabbed onto a desk to support himself and clenched his hand I-Z-U-K-U. Crack. Izuku's eyes snapped over to the person who was yelling. A young man, early twenty seconds, clad in a red, white, and blue suit with stars all over it, a golden staff on his back. Looking down at his hand he saw several fragments of wood fall between his fingers to the floor. Sylvester. He gave a soft smile as he stepped forward, carefully placing his hand on Izuku's shoulder and pulled the green at as Izuku began to weep against Sylvester's chest. The older man had always felt like a big brother and treated Izuku as his sibling. Come on Izuku, I'll walk you home. Izuku nodded into Sylvester's chest as he picked up his bag and walked out, the American-themed hero following behind him. The two were silent as they began their walk from Aldera, Izuku looking over to the koi pond and seeing his notebook floating on the top of the water. He stepped over and picked it up and frowned at the book. Years of research and analysis work. Gone in under a minute because of one explosive asshole. The pages were soggy and sticking together. The ink and pencil notations of his notes were washed and faded. 
and the book itself was burned with several of the pages either missing completely or halfway. Bakugu's page stood glaring out from the front. Izuku ripped it out and crumbled it in his fist. He just wanted to get home and draw the others, just to end this crappy day. Izuku began his walk, Sylvester again following him as the two began to head home. So, Sylvester began as they walked, trying to break the awkward silence. Did you see any of the others today? Izuku nodded. Sylvester continued to talk, trying to get Izuku's mind off of Bakugu and the others. He was trying but everywhere Izuku looked he saw quirks. A father and daughter with glowing hair, a quirk. A woman with feathers along her arms, a quirk. A giant of a man with a rhino mutation, a quirk. Quirks, 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 quirks everywhere. Of all shapes and sizes. And none for him. Not unless you counted the oddities within him. Ho. Huh. The doctor was confused. A bushy eyebrow raised above his thick glasses as he looked at Izuku's paperwork. This is, strange to say the least. What do you mean doctor? Izuku's mom sat next to him while he held his All Might figure. Mrs. Midoriya. I honestly have no idea on how I can even begin to describe this. Biologically your son is quirkless. He held up an X-ray. If you look right here at Izuku's pinky toe, you'll see he possesses two joints instead of the singular joint that all quirked people possess. It's an evolutionary signifier that your son has absolutely zero quirk factor in him. Zero quirk factor. I wasn't the best in biology. What's a quirk factor? His mom had a tighter grip on his hand as she rubbed her thumb against his palm. Izuku was still. His All Might figure fell from his hands and hit the floor. His mom held out her hand and activated her quirk, causing it to float to her as she put it in her purse. A quirk factor is the part of a person's genetic code that tells if they have a quirk or not. It's a signal for the body essentially, like an on or off switch, and this is where it gets strange for your son Mrs. Mitter. As I stated before, your son has the double joint, a sign of quirklessness. We also ran his blood to see if he has a quirk factor and that this was a false negative and that came up negative as well. Then we found what I can only describe as multiple genetic abnormalities within him. The doctor sat down across from them and looked at him. Izuku, have you ever done anything strange? Something like a quirk but not. I lifted a car, not above my head but still high enough. That's the reason why we came in. My husband and I thought it was Izuku's quirk but there are no strength enhancers in either of our families. Yet my five-year-old son lifted a car high enough for the person under it to crawl out. The doctor blinked and looked at his notes again. From what I can see, the genetic oddities in Izuku promote muscle growth and strengthen his skeleton. Tell me do your senses sometimes act funny? Izuku nodded. How so? I can hear really well, and I can see things far away, not super far but still far. The doctor nodded at this before pulling out some paper and a pen and began writing on them. These are the names and offices of several specialists I know who are skilled in gene research and quirk studies. He ripped the paper off the pad and handed it to Izuku's mom. I will be honest with you Mrs. Mitter. I have no idea what is wrong with your son. Izuku and Sylvester continued their walk, with Izuku taking a sharp turn to a nearby underpass. Uh, Izuku, why are we going through here? Up ahead is the market square. Katsuki and his little gang of thugs will hang around that area, and I'd really like to not deal with them again today. Besides, this is technically a shortcut. Sylvester looked at the underpass. He was unimpressed to say the least. I understand not wanting to see the Bomeranian again today but why? This looks like a killer's hideout and last I checked I can't fight back. So, we'll be quick. Izuku began to walk forward into the underpass, the shadows creeping around him. See Sylvester, it's not that bad. Just hold your head high and soldier on forward. The manhole in front of them shot out of its holding into the side, a green slime rising from the sewers below. The singular eyeball in it looked right at him. Damn it. A medium-sized invisibility cloak. This could be useful. The slime lunged towards Izuku and wrapped around him before he could dodge. Holding him tightly, it began to force its way into his throat. Izuku began to choke as he felt himself drowning while he continued to thrash against the slime, grabbing at it and clawing it with his fingers. Are you serious kid? My body's made of liquid, you can't harm it. Don't worry, it'll all be over in 45 seconds. Izuku began to black out as he heard Sylvester screaming his name. Thanks a lot kid, you're my hero. Izuku was drowning and blacking out. His lungs were on fire. He couldn't breathe. His movements were getting slower, weaker. He was in a golden desert. The sun was setting and giving off rays of orange and pink. Before him was a woman, wings upon her back and clad in white linens. Fiery red locks with gold woven into them tumbled down to her shoulders in waves as she looked at him with piercing emerald eyes. Find me beloved. Texas smash. The desert was ripped away from Izuku's vision as the slime was flung from his body and ripped apart due to the massive change in air pressure. Izuku fell to the ground, his vision going black. C.R.E. He was in a desert, a bronze construct behind him. Ka. T. R. There was a man wearing black in front of him, a gold lightning bolt on his chest and a cold wrath in his eyes. Part. He was on a throne next to the woman he loved. Ka. T. 
He was in a battle, knights around him, a man in golden armor that he had to keep safe at all costs. Part. R. He was alongside a gunslinger with a partially melted face and a grim disposition. Cart. He was at a table, the same one from his dreams. The others were at the table as well, along with the ones he had only seen in his dreams. He was about to yell something. Izuku's head shot to the side from an impact as he looked up to see him, the greatest hero to ever live with a smile on his face. All Might. Izuku's voice cracked as he quickly flipped over and vomited what were hopefully the remaining pieces of the slime villain that just attacked him. The hero patted him on the back to help get the remaining pieces out. Just breathe in now. Are you okay citizen? Izuku was trying so hard not to fanboy he really was. Do you need medical aid? I'm fine, All Might sir. The blonde titan gave his iconic smile. Well, it looks like you're moving around just fine now. All Might hoisted Izuku to his feet and patted him down. Sorry about that back there. I didn't mean for you to get caught up in my justicing. Usually, I pay more attention to keep bystanders safe, but it seems the sewers are more difficult to navigate than I thought. Now young citizen, thank you for your assistance but I need to get this evildoer into a cell where he belongs. Izuku picked up his bag, noticing his analysis book had All Might's signature on one of the pages. I thank you for this All Might, it will become a family heirloom. Izuku quickly put his analysis book back in his backpack as All Might picked up a bottle containing the slime. Now then, away I go. Wait. Izuku rushed forward and grabbed onto the hero's leg as he took off, the force of their jump causing his hair to fly back and his face to push into a rough grin. I have to ask you something. He could barely get the words out due to the g-forces of their speed. What are you doing kid? You need to let go. I can't let go, I'll die if I do that. Hang on. All Might directed their jump to a nearby building and pulled Izuku into his arms before they came crashing down on the roof. Thanks, Izuku quickly hopped out of the hero's arms as he dusted himself off. I'm so sorry about doing this I just need to ask you something. I promise it'll be really quick. All Might stood there, slightly clenching his teeth while he lightly held his side. Okay young one, ask your question. This was his chance, his one chance. He knew the others would be behind every decision he made but to hear him say it. He had to hear it from him, and Izuku knew he couldn't mess this up. He took in a breath, exhaled, and began to speak. All my life I've wanted to be like you, to be a hero. Not one that would deliver justice for the roar of the crowds, but a hero to help people simply because it was the right thing to do. I was labeled as quirkless when I was five and even the doctors that I spoke to believe I have something. I have no quirk but I'm stronger than normal, faster than normal, my hearing and sight were called abnormal and while I have all these things, I still have no quirk. So, I am asking you, a hero who is one to defend the innocent and not a hero for fame or fortune, can I be a hero like you? All Might opened his mouth to speak, only for a burst of smoke to appear around him and cover the rooftop. All Might, Izuku rushed into the smoke, pulling his shirt over his nose as he looked around for the hero. All Might where are you? Izuku looked around, the smoke stinging his eyes, before spotting a silhouette of a scrawny man with shaggy hair. It's alright my boy. The man's voice rasped as he stepped forward, the smoke beginning to vanish as he did so. I am here. Izuku slipped into a combat stance as he raised his fists. Who are you? What have you done with all might? Izuku's voice was cold and unforgiving as his eyes narrowed. If this man harmed the number one hero, he would pay. The man simply raised his hands. It's okay my boy, I assure you I am all might. Izuku lowered his fist slightly as he looked closely at the man before him and noted the similarities between them. You have a transformation quirk. That explains a lot. No one knows your name or what your quirk is. Everyone always believes it to be a strength quirk but a transformation one makes sense as no one has seen you outside of costume ever. All Might chuckled at that. That's a good guess, a very good one actually. But no, my quirk is not a transformation one. Do you mind if I show you something? Izuku nods as All Might raises his shirt, revealing a mess of scar tissue that covered the left side of his abdomen. You know how people at the beach will suck in their stomachs to look bigger? That's essentially what I do. I got this scar five years ago. It couldn't have been Toxic Chainsaw then. That's an impact-based wound, someone would have punched you there. If it was Toxic Chainsaw, it would have left a jagged scar from the ripping. Izuku looked up. Who did this? All Might's eyes widened for a brief moment in surprise as he looked at Izuku. You know your stuff kid. But you are right, it wasn't Toxic Chainsaw. That punk couldn't have hit me if he tried. But it was a villain, the worst of all of them. Our final battle was one that left him dead. And me losing my stomach, a lung, and a large chunk of my intestines. All Might let go of his shirt as he looked at Izuku. Because of these injuries, I can only use my quirk for 3 hours a day and if I go over my limit, I will lose time and be able to use it less. So, I have to answer your question honestly, young man. Then no, I'm sorry but you can't be a hero without a quirk. While it would be absolutely incredible to see, it would only lead to death. I'm so sorry. All Might looked on in regret. Izuku felt cold. He couldn't cry. Not now, especially not in front of him. But he understood. It still didn't stop him from hurting. 
I, I see. He looked up at All Might. The hero in question was walking over to the rooftop entrance before looking back at him. If you still wish to help people, then become a police officer, a doctor, a lawyer even. There's no one stopping you from choosing a different path young man. The door shut behind him and Izuku was left alone on the rooftop. The sun was starting to get low leaving a golden glow in the sky. Izuku stepped over to the ledge and sat down, his legs hanging off the rooftop. Izuku, are you okay? He looked back to see Terry. The older hero was in his usual bright green tunic and vermilion red cowl and leggings. His face was one of worry as he looked at Izuku. I'm, I'm not alright Terry. He patted the rooftop ledge and Terry stepped over, the sunlight glinting off the fair play on his belt as he sat down. Both of them just sat there for a moment, the silence washing over them as they looked out on Musutafu. I'm not going to jump, if that's what you're worried about. It would hurt mom more than me. Both of them sat as Izuku leaned into Terry's side. It's okay kid, let it out. Izuku began to cry as Terry held him close. You deserve so much better than this Izuku. He said no. I know. If he said no, then I really can't be a hero. Terry opened his mouth to speak but Izuku cut him off. I know what happens to quirkless people Terry. We don't live long. We end up a statistic. Either of suicide or someone who want a punching bag. Izuku looks at him. My people are dying, either by their own hand, a schoolmate's hand, or at the hands of lynch mobs. I can't even find a job because of my quirk status. Izuku yelled as Terry held him close. I, I can't anymore Terry, I'm sorry. The two of them sat there for a bit longer as the sun continued to dip lower. We should head home now. We can wait longer if you need to Izuku. I, thank you, but I'm okay. Izuku pushed himself up as he stepped away from the ledge, Terry following closely behind. The halls of the building they were in were dark as Izuku stepped out on the street, backpack over his shoulders and ready to head home. The two of them began walking back home. Boom. Izuku turned to the sound of a familiar explosion to see the clouds from it flow into the sky. Boom. Another one fired off, ripping at part of a building and sending rubble crashing down. It was coming from the market. Izuku ran towards it. People were in danger. There was that feeling that he had ever since he was a kid. That whenever someone was in danger it roared at him to act, to protect, to fight. Izuku raced through the growing crowd and pushed past people who were near the front of the line, and he saw it. The slime villain from before, in the center of the square fires raging around it as it grew to a massive height, and inside it was Katsuki, clawing at the villain and firing off explosions trying to harm it only for the shots to go wild and hit the nearby buildings. Looking around further, Izuku saw Death Arms, Kamui Woods, Backdraft, and the baseball hero Slugger standing at the front. Woods was pulling people out of the flames that were caught up in Katsuki's explosions. Each time he would do so would leave his costume and body smoking and charred, he couldn't get closer without burning to ash. Slugger had one of his bats out and was trying to keep the crowd back as they kept trying to push forward and into the line of fire. Backdraft was trying to put out the fires Katsuki was setting and was currently working on a department store fire while Izuku could see several workers above were signaling for help. And Death Arms, he was standing there, just looking at Katsuki drowning and not doing a damn thing. The bottle must have fallen out. Izuku picked up the whisper as he looked through the crowd and saw All Might standing there, unable to transform as he was out of time. All Might was out of time because of him, Katsuki was in danger because of him. The crowd was in danger from either the sludge pile in front of them or Katsuki's wild shots because of him. Look, it's Mount Lady. Someone yelled as Izuku turned to see the titanic woman racing down the streets in her giant form, only to stop as she was almost at the market. I can't get through, the streets are too narrow. Can't you shrink down? Slugger yelled back at her as he was still trying to push the crowd back. If I do, then I won't be able to regrow for five minutes. That kid will be dead by then. He needs help now. My punches aren't affecting the villain. And the boy inside blew me away with his blasts. I won't be able to stay still long enough before I'm shot away again. Well then what's the plan then Death Arms? Backdraft called over as another explosion ripped apart a nearby building, causing him to spray both of them with his hoses. I'm sending in a message to command. We need someone with a better quirk because we can't do a thing. Death Arms was cut off as Kamui Woods screamed, one of his arms cracking and breaking leaving a burnt stump where it used to be. The hero fell to his knees only for Death Arms to catch him. Rest kid, I got this. Mount, call in a medic. Kamui's down an arm. I'm trying. I can't get through. There's still people in there. Kamui reached out his other arm. I can still get them. No, you're on crowd control with Slugger. I'll get the civilians out. Death Arms yelled as he rushed forward into the flames. This was a disaster. Kamui was missing an arm, Katsuki was dying, and the destruction was getting worse. Izuku snarled as he looked at the slime villain, and his eye. That eye was the one solid thing on him, a weak spot. If Slugger could hit a ball at the eye, it could daze the villain long enough for someone to pull Katsuki out, 
and it would need to be someone who could take a hit and push on through it, or someone that was used to being hit by explosions. Like him, Slugger. The hero looked over to him as he was fending off the crowd. The eye. Its weak spot is its eye. Hit it in the eye. Kid I can't hear you. You need to stay back. He couldn't hear him, he had to save Katsuki. Izuku cursed to himself as he charged forward just as another explosion brought down the side of a building on a fleeing civilian. A blonde girl with a frantic look in her eyes as a brick struck the back of her head and caused her to crash to the ground as she was knocked out. H-I-M-I -I. A cry from the crowd sounded out as a brunette girl with a bob pushed forward and passed the line as Izuku did as well. The two of them racing into the fire and towards the villain. The girl racing for the blonde as Izuku slid next to the two of them, the sight was not pretty. The blonde girl had a spot of blood on the back of her head and was unresponsive. She was breathing though. Her body was surrounded and covered by other pieces of rubble though. Looking around, Izuku spotted a broken piece of pipe. Grabbing it he wedged it under the rubble and pushed, lifting it for the brunette to pull her out as the flames roared around them. Get your friend out of here. Izuku leapt back as a slime tendril smashed between him and the two girls causing debris to fly up as they stumbled. Go now. The brunette nodded as she ran, her friend in a bridal carry, back to the police line. Izuku hefting his pipe piece and giving it a rough swing as he rushed towards the villain, unhooking his backpack as he ran. Hey S-L-I-M-E-B-A-L-L. -L. The villain turned to him, its eye seemed to widen. You again. It was focused on him. What the hell do I have to do to get rid of you? To quote the asshole you nabbed there. Izuku chucked his back. Die. The bag flew and struck the villain in the eyeball, causing it to recoil in pain as it screamed. Izuku raced forward, leaping over rubble piles and grabbing a piece of rebar as he reached the villain sticking the bar out towards Katsuki. He speared it into the slime towards his former friend as Katsuki was dragged back into the slime. Grab it. Katsuki fished around frantically for the bar, the sludge making it difficult to move. His hands wrapped around the bar as Izuku pulled, Katsuki bursting free from the slime as he fell forward. Izuku catching him as he fell. We're getting out of here right now. Katsuki nodded as Izuku hauled him to his feet. The two of them began to run back towards the line with Katsuki stumbling every few steps as he struggled to get oxygen in his lungs. He could see death arms approaching the barrier with several other civilians. They were almost safe. A cold coil wrapped around Izuku's leg as he fell forward, Katsuki falling out of his grip into the ground as Izuku was dragged back against broken concrete and brick. He was hauled into the air and turned to see the villain with not only what he could describe as a pissed-off expression, but a red spot on its eye. Just for that, I'm gonna make it slow. And I'm gonna make it hurt. The villain shoved Izuku back inside himself. Izuku's lungs began to burn as he couldn't breathe. He could see the crowd through a green tent as he began to black out. Izuku was lying in bed, computer shut down and in his All Might pajamas as he cried quietly into the pillow. All he did was ask his mom a single question. Could he be a hero without a quirk? All she said was I'm sorry. He didn't need to hear that he didn't want to hear that. His eyes were clenched as tears trailed down his cheeks and started to soak his pillow only to freeze as he felt a hand running through his hair, and he knew his mom was in bed. I know it hurts, God I know it hurts so much right now. The man's voice was calm and relaxing. I can't promise things will get better, but I can promise that you'll never be alone. Izuku screamed, the lights turned on, and his mother was in the doorway, behind the strange man wearing what looked like a hero costume. Izuku, baby, what's wrong? His mom rushed forward and threw the man in the costume as if he wasn't there. I, I, she can't see me or hear me for that matter. The man told Izuku, giving him a soft smile. His mom gave no signs of hearing him, and she walked right through him. I had a nightmare. I'm sorry. His mom kissed him on the head. Do you want to sleep in my room tonight? I'm okay mom, I'm sorry for waking you. He had questions to ask this man. His mom nodded and left the room, the door closing behind her as she went back to bed. Who are you? Izuku asked, getting a closer look at the stranger. He had pale skin with blonde hair and looked western. He wore a red sweater with an old-fashioned lantern on the chest and green pants tucked into red boots. The cape he was wearing was high-collared in the same dark purple as his mask while he had his hands on his broad leather belt. The green ring on his left hand almost seemed to shine in the dark room. My name is Alan, kid. I'm, I'm a friend, an old friend. He knew this man. He didn't know how but he felt that he knew him. Why are you here? Why can't my mom see or hear you? Is this a quirk? Am I going crazy? Are you a hero? I don't know who you are sir, how can I know you? All right all right kid, slow down. I'm here because, well, a bunch of us managed to earn a reward from the big man. Speck really came through for us with that, even though you won't be able to meet him. Your mom can't see or hear us because only you can. This is a gift that we've all been given. I don't know what a quirk is I'm afraid so I can't answer that, but I can assure you that you're not crazy. Yes, I was a hero. I can't say much on that though, not until it's time I'm afraid. But trust me when I say this, we do know each other. I promise you that. Izuku began to cry again. His weeping was kept as softly as possible. 
Hey, hey, I got you. Alan sat down and began to wipe at the tears, only for his hand to go through. I thought that would work, he said dejectedly. Alan, Izuku began, the hero looking him in the eyes. Can someone without powers be a hero? The older man smiled at him and pulled him close. Yes, Izuku felt pain. He was on the ground, and he could feel someone pushing up and down on his chest. Come on, wake up. The person's lips were on his as Izuku's eyes burst open. He felt something sticky inside his throat as he turned and began coughing. Chunks of slime flying free and hitting the ground in front of him as he knelt on his hands and knees. Thank you. He managed to get out between the coughing as he looked over to see the brunette girl from before. The area was surrounded by slime and starting to rain. And the crowd was surrounding All Might in his giant form. All Might managed to arrive. He punched the air. And the villain was. Scattered. Also, it started to rain. Izuku looked over at the girl. She had a massive smile on her face as she stood up and held out a hand. Do you need help? Izuku nodded and took her hand, the girl pulling him to his feet with ease. Thank you. What happened to your friend? Katsuki. The others. Her smile never left her face as she spoke calmly. Hemi is in one of the ambulances back there, same with your friend. She gestured back towards the small line of ambulances that had shown up. Kamui Woods was transported to Yua from what I heard. Are you okay? Do you want to speak with the doctors here? They wouldn't treat him. He knew they wouldn't treat him. I'll be fine, thank you. Izuku pulled his hand out of the girls as he began to walk away only to stop as a bat was placed in front of him along his chest, stopping him in his path. Where are you going? Slugger always made him uneasy. He never knew why. The man was dressed in an old school baseball uniform for crying out loud. Home, excuse me. He tried to move past only for Slugger to grab his arm, the hairs on his neck raising. Is something wrong sir? You shouldn't have done that kid. You should have left it to the pros. If I did then Katsuki would be dead. It was a bad matchup. We didn't have the right quirks to fight him. Izuku was pissed, he turned and glared. I am a quirkless 14-year-old and I was able to stun that walking plumbing disaster with a damn backpack. You carry multiple baseballs on yourself and could have struck him in the eye with one of them. Slugger looked down at his shoes before releasing Izuku and wiping his hand on his uniform. So, a damn knoll got cocky and wanted to take a shot at the big leagues, huh? Excuse me. The voice from the girl was cold. Izuku turned to look at her and nearly froze. She was furious. Her eyes almost looked like they were on fire. What the fuck did you just say? She had an accent starting to come through, can't I if he was correct. You better not have called him what I thought you did. People were starting to look their way as the girl kept getting louder. I saw what you did, how you just poked him with your bat and walked on. I saw how the EMTs ignored him while he was unconscious. I heard you say that fucking word you quirkest piece of shit. Her hands were clenched, and she looked ready to take a swing. Furthermore, you not only chose to abandon someone in need, but you and the rest of the heroes chose to applaud that blonde asshole for holding out as you put it, despite the fact that the fires were started by him, despite the fact at least 15 were wounded because of him, and despite the fact he brought the side of a fucking building down on my girlfriend. She continued to yell at Slugger, putting herself between him and Izuku. He looked around to see the crowd, and the cameras were focused on her as Slugger let go of his arm. Izuku took several steps back as he turned and began to walk away. No one noticed his departure, not even the girl as she continued to roar like a dragon at Slugger. He walked as quickly as he could while staying silent, grabbing his backpack from the rubble as he made his way out of the market. Izuku continued to walk home. His uniform was charred, slimed, and pretty much trash at this point. He couldn't tell his mom about this. He knew that she would already know though, she had that skill. D.A.K.U. Izuku was done. He was done with Katsuki for the day. What? He growled back as he continued walking, Katsuki grabbing his shoulder and turning him around. Listen here, I would never ask for help from a weakling like you. Don't think you can look down on me huh? Got that. I was fine by myself. You're just a quirkless failure that wouldn't even cut it as a rent-a-cop. You're still nothing. The pebble everyone steps over on their path to greatness you got that. You didn't help me. You did nothing. Don't forget it. I don't owe you a thing. He shoved Izuku's shoulder as he began to walk away. At least I didn't maim a pro hero, injure a crowd of civilians, and knock down several buildings. Katsuki stopped as he glared at Izuku. What did you just say? He hissed. You heard me, Katsuki. He could smell burning caramel. You made the situation worse with your actions and were praised for it. That's not exactly different from what would normally happen. But you nearly got people killed today. Kamui Woods lost an arm due to the fires you started. What was that hero name you called yourself as a kid? Dynamite. Warhead sounds like a better name if you want to be a villain. His dad taught him a simple phrase as a kid. Talk shit get hit. It's not like he cared anymore. Katsuki swung a right hook striking Izuku in the face. He could feel blood starting to go down his cheek. Izuku stumbled back and planted his feet, glaring back at the blonde. Go home Katsuki, we're done. He turned and walked away. 
leaving Katsuki standing there in shock with his fists clenched. Izuku entered the apartment he shared with his mom. Towing off his shoes he snuck past the kitchen where he heard his mom humming as she cooked. He snuck down the hall and into his room. His room which was largely filled with All Might merch. There were other pieces as well, some Hawks items, a few present Mike pieces, a handmade eraser head plush he found on Etsy and his drawings. After today though, he found it difficult to look at the smile plastered on the hero's face. He would take some of them down tomorrow. Izuku sighed as he knelt down and pulled the medical kit out from under his bed and got to work on his new wounds, planning to help with dinner when he was done. Inko Midoriya was not a fool. While she gave people the benefit of the doubt she also knew when something was wrong and when someone needed help. Her son was almost always that person. Ever since that visit to the doctors all those years ago, she worried for her son, especially as even she knew that she gave the wrong answer to him all those years ago. It may have come out wrong, but it was still the wrong answer. He needed to feel hope, but she failed in that. And ever since she could see that light, that spark inside him that made her sweet son into the man he was slowly dimming. She heard the kitchen door open as Izuku stepped in and began to help her with dinner. She could see the bandages poking up out of his shirt and smell the wastewater coming off of him. Izuku, what happened? He turned and smiled, his eyes were dim, and there was a scratch mark on his face along with a bruise starting to form. Got caught up in a villain attack, I'm fine mom. He reached to grab the seasoning only for her to lightly grab his arm. Izuku, I'm fine, I promise. He was lying, she could tell. At least let me check over your work after dinner. He nodded at that as the two of them finished cooking and sat down to eat. His first aid was as immaculate as always when he would have to fix himself up. She never knew how he was able to stitch himself up so well. They both cleaned up and got ready for bed, and Ko looking to her son as he entered his room. Izuku, he stuck his head back out. Yes mom, Yul. She couldn't finish her sentence, the words plugging up her throat. Izuku came out of the room and hugged her, his chin on top of her head due to him having shot up over the years. I'll be here, I promise. He kissed her head and went back to his room, calling out a good night as she closed her bedroom door, looking to the empty side of the bed as she crawled under the covers and let sleep take her. Izuku closed his door and sat on his bed, his head in his hands. Today was such a mess, and tomorrow would most likely be the same. He felt a hand on his shoulder. Turning he saw a familiar black goggled cowl with pointed ears coming off of it, the Victorian-style overcoat that was cut to look like wings and the bat symbol on the chest. Elliot never came by often, but when he did Izuku would listen closely, as his friend would always help him. The others told me what happened. Elliot's voice came out as gruff as usual. Do you believe it? Believe what? What they said, what he said. Elliot gestured to All Might's face. He had my best interests at heart Elliot. Nothing I can do about that. That's not the question I asked though. Elliot stepped forward, kneeling by his bed. He placed a gloved hand on Izuku's as he looked at him. Do you believe that you can't be a hero? How can I? All the evidence is pointing to me being unable to even try, let alone accept it. Izuku, do you train? Izuku merely pointed at the patched up Endeavor punching bag in the corner of his room. I know Ted taught you boxing. Hell I know Terry taught you Parker and that brat taught you evasion tactics, but do you actually train with other people? No dojo would take me, neither would most gyms. Then make a plan, figure out how to train and get stronger, because I believe you can be a hero, and I know one day you'll understand why all of us think so. Elliot stood up, his coat wrapping around him like a cape. As he turned to leave, he stopped and looked back at Izuku. I believe you can be a hero son. Even if you don't Elliot vanished as Izuku fell asleep, thinking of his friend's words as he closed his eyes and dreamed of the table again that night. Hawkman, Rebirth, Issue 2 Izuku was sitting on the bench as he thought about what had happened yesterday. He was simply unable to draw despite seeing everyone at the table again last night. He still didn't know what it meant. He could see everyone sitting at a round table, and he was about to call something out, but he didn't know what it meant. He heard a creaky and a grunting sound from next to him as he saw a man in a gold and black hooded cloak with an hourglass symbol on his chest. Hi Rex. The older hero let out a light huff as he leaned back against the bench. Izuku looked back down to his drawing. He had to get Johnny's hair just right. Are you one who gives up Izuku? Rex's gruff timber cut right through any of his thoughts about his dreams as he looked at his friend in shock. What? Izuku fumbled his pencil as he was shocked by the question. Rex, on the other hand, had a slight frown that could be best described as mournful. Why would you ask that? Cause I get the feeling that Elliot's talk with you didn't go over that well last night. Am I right about that? Elliot could try to get him excited, and the majority of the time he was able to, but in this case it didn't work. Elliot's talk didn't work like it normally did and Izuku was still in the same depressive state he was yesterday. He tried, he really did but, look there's always the support course and I can take that. You could, but do you want to go into support? Rex leaned forward as his eyes seemed to glow. Rex, I don't know what you mean. You ask support course is one of the best in the world. 
and it would allow me to work in heroics. Those are good reasons, and I'll give you that as a coup. But is it what you want? It's, I, he couldn't think of a reason. I want to be a hero. I want to save people Rex. But it's not like anyone will let me. Didn't the rat guy, Principal Nedzu, right? Principal Nedzu, say that anyone could apply, no matter the quirk status. It's one thing to say something. It's another to follow through on it. This is someone who knocks down quirkist buildings with a wrecking ball, goes after the lynch groups and destroys them on a psychological level, and who gave the diet a polite version of the middle finger during a live televised session when they called him out about rolling back the quirkless ban. He seems like he'll follow through. He put a hand on Izuku's shoulder. So, the world may be against you kid. How about you show them who you are, show them what they're missing out on. Cause I guarantee they'll regret all the shit they pulled when you step into the light. Rex stood up and looked at him, his eyes seeming to shine behind his mask. So, I'm gonna ask you again Izuku, do you want to be a hero? Izuku looked him in the eyes. He took a deep breath and thought of what everyone had told him his entire life. I'm sorry. His mom. Quirkless people can't be heroes. Tatsuki. While it would be absolutely incredible to see, it would only lead to death. All Might. Yes. Alan. I believe you can be a hero son, even if you don't. Elliot. I. I want to be a hero, because even if no one here believes in me, I know that someone, somewhere, does. Izuku stood up. I'm going to be a hero, no matter what anyone says. This is the path I choose. Rex gave a near feral grin. You'll be a damn fine one kid, and I know you'll understand soon. Now go on, you got classes to head to. Izuku nodded and sprinted off to school, hoping it would be quieter today and that no one would be noticing him. Class went fairly normal, with some oddities of course. Specifically, with Bakugu leaving him alone, Izuku wasn't going to question it though. He turned in his work and left Aldera, pulling out his cracked phone to check out several different gyms. His mom already knew he would be out longer for the day, so he had free range. He ducked into the bathroom to change out of his uniform into a normal shirt and shorts before checking out the gym locations he had marked down. I still think Fair Play might be able to help you. Terry pointed out the location on Izuku's phone. How can you know that, Terry? Consider it a hunch. The man replied as he gave a smirk. Besides, if they didn't then they would be breaking their mission statement from all those years ago. You could ask the sanctuary, they might know a place. Ted added as he pointed out the location. An unmarked cafe Izuku had been a constant patron of since he was a kid. Let's try fair play first, get that out of the way. Izuku pocketed his phone before standing up from the bench and stretching. With his backpack on, he began jogging down the street towards fair play. Terry, I have to ask. Izuku began as the man raced next to him, their paces matching. What exactly is fair play? How come I've never heard of it? Terry smiled. Fair play is and was always meant to be a safe space for everyone. It serves multiple purposes from an activities center to a shelter and everything in between. That is if they still follow the mission statement of course. And that would be. Terry looked at him, his eyes were saddened as he smiled. To help anyone, without ever asking for everything in return. So, you must be a fan then. What with your belt? Izuku pointed to Terry's belt. And the words fair play emblazoned on it. But how do you know about this place? You'll have to wait and see kiddo, else you wouldn't believe me if I told you. Izuku shook his head as they continued their run, eventually spotting the brick building, the words fair play on the sign out front. We'll be waiting outside Izuku. Terry replied as Izuku stepped up and opened the door, a chime sounding overhead as he entered the lobby. Reds, greens, and gold banners were everywhere. A woman with two-toned hair sat behind it as she was going over files. Behind her was a portrait of a grinning man in a suit with copper-colored hair sat behind the desk. Izuku read it as he approached the desk Mr. T. Sloan, our founder, a man who always believed in fair play. It couldn't be, no way, but he felt so familiar. Sir, Izuku was cut out of his musings as he looked at the receptionist. Are you alright? I. Sorry, I got a bit lost in thought. I was told that you offer gym memberships. She smiled and looked down at his shoes briefly before glancing up again. Of course sir, one second. She pulled out several forms and handed them to him. Now sir I am required by law to tell you that the Q laws prevent those of quirkless nature from applying for fair play services. However, I see you possess a minor mutation in your hair like I do. She gestured to her own bright blue and bubblegum pink locks. So, I'm just going to mark you down for that real quick. Wait miss I don't. She held up her hand, cutting Izuku off. Sir, by fair play's policy I am required to inform you that by admitting to being quirkless that you will be denied service. But only if you admit to being quirkless, which you aren't, because of your green hair, which is a minor mutation, like mine. She replied slowly, putting emphasis on the last few words as she kept tapping the desk with one finger, pointing downward as she did so. Izuku looked down to see the desk itself was clear, revealing the woman's shoes. Her red shoes with a single white star on the ankle for each one. Just like his. Oh, oh. Izuku realized. Yes, I have a minor mutation that makes my hair green. He felt bad lying, but in this case it was necessary. 
The woman at the desk smiled and helped him finish up the remaining paperwork. She then passed him a badge, telling him to keep it on his person whenever he was here and pointing out the direction of the gym. Why are you helping me, miss? She leaned back, pointing to the portrait behind her. What do you know about our founder? Not much I'm afraid. She smiled. Let me tell you about him then. Terry Sloan graduated college at age 13. Afterwards he spent several years traveling around the world and learning everything he could. He was considered for the Olympics due to his athleticism and was a savant in multiple disciplines due to his eidetic memory. In his early 20s he chose to dedicate his life to helping others no matter their origin, race, or creed. In other words, fair play. Her smile dropped into a frown. That was before his murder however. Murder? He was shot in the back by a couple of cops along with some chemist before the age of quirks came around. No one knew why. The cops claimed he was embezzling, that he was a traitor. Everyone else claimed otherwise. Huh. Izuku looked at the portrait again. So he was a good man. He believed in the best of people, that anyone who put their heart and mind into what they did could become terrific. Izuku looked at the portrait again, feeling calmer knowing it was there. Thank you miss. Hisakawa. Izuku bowed. Thank you Hisakawa-san. He went to the side and entered the locker room, pulling out a pair of gym clothes from his bag and changing into them. Putting his bag and the rest of his clothes in an empty locker, Izuku stepped out of the locker room and into the gym, looking over the range of equipment. So, I need at the very least a sparring partner, possibly endurance training, maybe some strength and speed training. Izuku was bumped forward by someone and spun around ready to strike back, only to pause at the black-haired kid with pointy teeth putting his hands up as he stumbled back. Sorry man, didn't see you there. I was just putting these back. He pointed downward at the wrist and ankle weights that were on the floor. His grin was nervous as if he expected Izuku to lash out at him. Right, it's okay, you need a hand with that. Izuku lowered his arms and sheepishly rubbed the back of his head. First day here and I would have been kicked out for assault. He thought to himself. Yeah, thanks. The kid dropped his arms as he wiped his hands against the red tank top he was wearing. The two of them knelt, picking up the weights. I'm Kirishima Ijiro, nice to meet you man. Midoriya Izuku, nice to meet you too. I think, this guy was very much a happy individual as he was grinning and nearly bopping around the gym, kind of like a puppy. So, you knew here. I haven't seen you around before. First day actually, I think I might like it here. Kirishima continued to grin as the two of them turned in the weights. A friend of mine recommended this place if I want a shot at getting into you. A, they must be an awesome friend. Do they come by often? You should invite them next time. The evidence pointing to Kirishima possibly being a dog increased as his grin somehow got even wider than Izuku thought was possible. I don't know if they do, just that they recommended it for me. Awa, oh, it'd be nice to have another manly person around here. Don't get me wrong, just about everyone here is manly but it's always good to have more around. He must have been hearing him wrong. He must have. There's no way he heard it capitalized. I'm sorry, what do you mean by manly? Hiroshima seemed shocked for a moment before trying to school his features with widened eyes. You don't know the spirit of manliness. The chivalric code Crimson Riot held during his years as a hero. Okami my friend, come and hear the word of the manliest of heroes. The person who checked in their weights merely gave Izuku a look that stated good luck as Kirishima began to lightly drag him away from the desk. The taller boy chatted as he led Izuku towards a nearby rest zone. And that's the best summary of it. Kirishima finished some time later as the two of them sat in a rest area. Izuku sipped at his smoothie while Kirishima practically downed his a few gulps, another smoothie nearby. Bravery in the face of danger, knowing you're afraid yet pushing through it, and refusing to back down when others are in danger. I could agree with that idea. Izuku wrote down several notes on a spare napkin, along with a reminder to look more into Crimson Riot himself. Yeah, this whole code is the reason why I want to be a hero. Crimson Riot was my whole inspiration. It's not like I'll get in though, but I have to try. Izuku stopped writing and looked up to see Kirishima's smile was gone. An aura of nervousness was practically emitting from him. Why would you think you wouldn't get in? Kirishima rubbed at his knuckles. Well, it's just. I mean I. My quirk's not exactly flashy. Hero schools usually look for people with, you know, shinier and manly quirks, the ones that stand out and make people look on in awe. You know, like All Might. Kirishima held up a hand as it stiffened and turned to a shiny rocky texture. I mean I have my quirk and I suppose it's pretty cool. I call it hardening. It's pretty self-explanatory. I can only harden one part of my body at a time and it's not exactly the flashiest or the most useful though. A surge of righteous fury coursed through Izuku as he frowned at Kirishima's statement. You're kidding right. Kirishima looked over to Izuku. How can you say you're not useful? That looks like hematite rock you hardened into. It's practically metal. If you increase your iron intake you may actually turn into metal when you harden or you could increase the amount of your body that you can harden. That quirk turns you into a walking shield that can protect your fellow heroes and civilians that are in the way of being struck by villains. 
add in the right gear and you could be able to protect more parts of yourself. If you harden your hands and feet at the right time when you're about to strike a villain then you should be able to hit them harder as well. That's an amazing quirk you have and don't let anyone else tell you that. Am I clear? Kirishima blinked before looking like he was about to cry. Kiri, what did you do to my friend? Izuku turned to see what he could only describe as a wall of angry pink in a dark fuchsia off the shoulder shirt and magenta tiger striped legging. Pink skin, pink hair, and furious black and gold eyes glared at him as she stepped over to their table and seemed to place herself between the two of them. I swear to Kami, if you upset him, I'll. Mina, I'm good, it's happy tears I promise. Kirishima quickly cut off Mina's near snarl that she was making. The girl looking over at him and back at Izuku. Oh, sorry about that. She sat down next to Kirishima, the larger boy moving over to give her room. It's okay, not the worst thing I've heard. That did not seem to help as she narrowed her eyes at Izuku as he tried to keep a calm face. The silence between them was beginning to build as they kept staring at each other. At least it was before Kirishima broke it. Midoriya. This is my best friend, Ashido Mina. Mina this is Midoriya Izuku. Both looked at each other. Ashido seemed to be observing him carefully before giving off a massive grin and sticking out her hand. Nice to meet you Greeny. Greeny? Izuku questioned as he shook her hand, noting a slight tingling feeling he was getting from her skin. Probably related to her quirk. Yeah, Greeny, you know cause you got green eyes, green hair, Greeny. It's cute and works for you. Huh. At least it's not bush. Okay, Greeny it is, thanks Ashido. Call me Mina. Her grin never left her face as her curls bounced around. So, dance got out early. Hiroshima asked as he moved the other glass over to her, Mina taking it and sipping. Yeah, the others can't keep up. Kami did tell us she was applying to Shikesu though. And you are for us. Yes, Mina shouted as Izuku flinched and nearly dropped his glass as the other two looked on. Sorry, I tend to get a little excited. Mina replied nervously. So, what were you talking about before I came over? Oh, I brought up my quirk and Midoriya told me how it could be useful in heroics. He even told me things my old quirk counselors never brought up for how it works. And on top of it, he even told me how I could make it even more powerful. Mina blinked before turning towards Izuku. The look in her eyes, he could only describe it as thankful. While it is useful, you can have many heroes go on the attack, but you always need someone to defend the innocent. Kirishima has the ability to do so and the drive to be a hero. Why is it shocking that I am saying this? Because most of the people we go to school with are idiots. Mina replied. And if they're not idiots then they're something. Worse. Her voice had grown hollower as she rubbed at her arm and pulled her sleeve down over what looked like a burn. Kirishima however comforted his friend and put a hand on her shoulder. Well then, it seems we're more alike than I thought. Granted I got picked on because. Izuku slammed his mouth shut before he finished. He couldn't let anyone know, certainly not these two. They could rat him out as being quirkless and he wouldn't be able to train. Because, Hiroshima had a look of curiosity as he stared at Izuku. Nothing, no reason. It wouldn't work, but it was something. The two across from him looked at each other and nodded. So you're both applying to UA? He asked, hoping to change the topic. Hell yeah we are. You're looking at two of Japan's future heroes right here. Mina was grinning and practically hopping out of her seat. Are you applying as well? Please tell me you are. I mean you already helped Kiri and nobody else has done that. What do you mean Mina? You helped me. Kirishima looked back at Izuku with a grin of his own. You should have seen her when we were kids. Mina would be fighting off any bully that tried to start things. Anyone else would have. She fought off a villain that attacked our school when we were 11. It was just a would-be gangster. And she talked down. Kirishima paused as he looked at Mina. Fumahiro needed help. Not to be treated as a villain like they were planning on doing. I know. And Izuku remembered. About a year back in Chiba Prefecture there was a case at Mustafa Private Middle School. A bull in an abuse case that led to the main victim going on a rampage and attacking his classmate. All the news reports about the incident said the student was talked down and convinced to surrender by a classmate. No one was killed but several were injured, and the bullies were expelled from the school. That was you. Mina looked back and nodded. I didn't want anyone else to know. She seemed to shrink in her seat. And he did need help. He just had one bad day. Izuku replied. He would know. Just about every other day for him was a bad day. Yeah. The three of them sat at the table for a bit, the heaviness of the topic weighing them down as Izuku glanced around. He could not leave them like this. Well then, let me just say Mina, you already have a fan. She was confused. Anyone who can handle a highly stressful situation as you did is someone who is worthy of the title of hero. Mina gave a soft smile. So, what about you Midoriya? Are you applying to UA? I am, I already did actually. I'm hoping to go into heroics, but I've been told I should look for a sparring partner. It's actually the reason I'm here. Well look no further then. Mina gave a wild grin as she gestured to Kirishima. Kiri and I know a few tricks we can teach you. Granted I tend to use my legs a bit more when I fight. Yeah, we'll help you out. It wouldn't be manly if we didn't. I. Izuku honestly didn't know how to respond to that. 
people simply were not kind to him, excluding his mom because she was a saint. He stood up from his spot and bowed. Thank you, both of you. Don't worry Greeny. We'll have you ready in no time. It was late when Izuku left Fair Play. The sun was just starting to set, and his muscles were sore. He looked down at his phone and saw Kirishima and Mina's numbers in it and a promise to hang out again in the future. It was probably because he was focused on his phone, and the fact that he got the numbers of two people that he didn't see the girl when he turned the corner. Izuku collided with her, the girl falling back as he did so. Both of them dropped the items in their hands as they hit the ground. I'm so sorry, are you okay? Izuku pushed himself up as he held out a hand to the girl he ran into. Her hair was long and incredibly green. No, those were thorny vines she had for her hair. The vines were tied into a crown braid that framed her face and dark green eyes. She looked up at Izuku and took his hand as he pulled her to his feet. Forgive me, I was in a hurry and should have been watching where I was. The girl's tone was soft and calming to listen to, almost like a harp playing. No need miss, I'm the one who ran into you, if anything I should be apologizing. Izuku crouched down and picked up his phone along with the slightly battered book the girl had been holding. It was old and well used, though there were some markings on it that seemed off. A golden cross embroidered on the front revealed what the book was as Izuku looked up to pass it back to the girl, only to see a slight look of nervousness in her eyes as he held out the book, before freezing as he noticed the light burn marks on her ankle-length dress. I think this is yours. Izuku kept his voice calm as he looked at the girl, noticing she was peeking behind her lightly. Thank you. She replied letting out a sigh of relief as she took the book from Izuku and placed it in the bag at her side. I had thought. Never mind, you have a blessed day. She smiled, a light look of nervousness in her eyes as she began to walk off peeking behind her. Izuku didn't like this, was she being followed? Will you be alright? He could feel a tingling sensation crawling up his spine when he asked her. It reminded him of whenever he was in a room with Katsuki. I will, the girl called over her shoulder. I'm meeting up with some friends, thank you sir. I don't think I'm a sir. Izuku followed after her with a laugh. At least let me walk you there, miss. For peace of mind if that's alright, it is pretty laid out. She paused and looked back. Nervousness filled her eyes. Miss, are you alright? I'm fine, really, I am. It's just been one of those bad days. I'll be fine. She stopped as her eyes widened. Hey there Shizaki. A saccharine voice sounded behind them as Izuku turned to see a trio of girls approaching them. And he did not like the snide looks on their faces. It reminded him far too much of Katsuki for his liking. You left us far too soon. Oh, he did not like this at all. Walk away. His voice was cold as he crossed his arms. The trio stopped taking a step back in shock. Just walk away right now. Who the hell do you think you are? The leader of their group trying to regain control of the situation and failed miserably. Her hands igniting with dull red flames dancing between her fingers as she glared him down. Someone who really hates people like you. Now here's what you're going to do. You're going to turn around and walk away. You're going to leave. Shizaki, that's her name. Izuku turned back to her and softened his voice. Hoping she would remain calm. Yes, her voice was filled with shock. Okay, thank you. Anyway, you're going to leave Shizaki alone now. If you go after her again, we'll have problems. Izuku cracked his knuckles. And I enjoy dealing with problems. The leader of the group must have been an idiot as all she did was laugh. Oh, how brave of you, beating up a group of girls. She paused, the smile slipping off her face as Izuku started laughing. I'm gonna be honest with you. Some of the ladies I know would knock me over the head if I wouldn't fight back because you were girls. He wasn't lying. Dinah and Abigail were very clear in their lecture of fighting back, no matter the gender. Oddly enough it was the one thing both he and Katsuki would agree on. Do keep that in mind, now go ahead, and make my day. The lead girl smirked as the flames around her hands flared up, her friends activating their quirks as well with the first one extending short claws from her fingers while the second one's eyes started to glow. This isn't necessary Hino. Shizaki tried to defuse the situation as the three girls approached the two of them. There is no need for violence. Izuku stepped into a boxing stance as they got closer. The one with the claws would be difficult. Try to break her fingers to prevent her from using them. The glowing eyes are a possible emitter quirk. A strike to the head should keep her from using them, especially if the strike is close to the eyes. The one with the fire hands has been breathing faster since she ignited her quirk. It must rely on how much oxygen she has in her lungs. A strike to the abdomen or throat should cut off her air supply and extinguish her flames. Use a light strike if I go after the throat. What? Shizaki called out in a panic. The other three girls stopping their approach looking at Izuku with a slight panic. What the hell? Who even says shit like that? Must be a psycho, or a villain. I said that out loud, didn't I? Izuku asks Shizaki over his shoulder. Her light nod was all he needed to see. Damn it, Hino, I don't think this is a good idea. The claw girl took a step back. So we improvise. It's three on two and Shizaki never fights back. Yeah, but he's talking about breaking my fingers. He plans on putting out my eyes. This guy's insane. We should just leave. So you'll leave then. 
Izuku asked the group. Hino continued to glare at him for scaring her back up. What makes you think I'll? Hino stopped speaking, her hands extinguishing as she gave a wide smile. Ladies, are you blind? What? No, I'm sorry, why are you asking that? Because if you looked at his feet you would see he's a fucking null. An easy win that'll be brought down. Her hands reignited, this time brighter than before. And Shazaki won't be able to say shit about a future hero removing trash. Hino leapt forward, her hands coming down to burn Izuku, only to stop as a hand jabbed out. Izuku's fist colliding with her nose and crushing the cartilage. Hino fell to the ground as she cried out in pain while holding her nose. What the fuck? Nulls don't fight back. Her friends stepped forward, then stopped as they looked behind Izuku and Shizaki. Hey bitch. The two turned to see a group of three approaching them. A blonde boy with bright blue eyes and a sly grin alongside a silver-haired boy who was almost snarling at the girls as he cracked his knuckles. And the leader of the group who yelled at the girls being being possibly the most beautiful girl Izuku had ever seen as she stood tall with her copper-colored locks hanging in a ponytail, glaring at the girls with hardened teal eyes as the light muscle in her arms flexed. What the hell did I say about bothering Ibarra? I could have sworn I was clear about it. Not now Itsuka, the blonde began, his voice mocking and sharp as steel. It's clear that you spoke to them. However there are two possible reasons as to why they are suicidal to ignore your kind advice. The blonde gave a light grin as he peered down at them. The first is that they didn't understand what you said as they lacked the intellect to comprehend what you said, which is quite possible given their clickly bitch attitude. As he spoke, he gently led Ibarra behind himself and the new girl. Or the second is that they require someone to simply beat it into their heads. Oh, I'll gladly do that. The silver-haired boy rolled his shoulders as he stepped forward, only for the lead girl to grab his arm and stop him before he could continue on. You can't afford to get into any more fights, Tetsu. It'll come up on your records and you won't be able to apply with us. Her voice was calm and collected, keeping one eye on her friends and the other on the girls. Yomadabro. Izuku looked behind the girls to see Kirishima and Mina jogging towards them. You left your boxing tape behind. What's going on here? Both he and Mina took in the scene before them, which admittingly didn't look good. You're friends with this nut job. Hino yelled as she held her nose, blood dripping down her face. He broke my fucking nose. She and her little gang tried to attack Miss Shizaki and myself. Izuku gestured to Shizaki behind him. I'm going to guess these three are your friends miss. I, yes, Ibarra answered, holding tightly to her back. Oh please, who would believe a fucking null? You hit me first. What did you just say? It was Mina this time, her voice a cold sweetness that made Izuku's hair raise. Yeah, your so-called friend is a fucking null, a geneless abomination that should have been drowned at birth in. Hino stopped at the fury that seemed to radiate off Mina and Kirishima. The pink girl who earlier was kind and bubbly, who taught Izuku some of her kickboxing moves calmly stepped forward and picked up a soda can that was tossed on the sidewalk and crushed it in her hand. You think that's scary? Oh no, she crushed a can. I'm so afraid. The sound of fizzing cut off Hino as the can in Mina's hand melted, the remains hitting the ground which also began to bubble and fizz around it. My quirk is called acid umla shits, consider your next move very carefully. The girls looked at Mina in shock as she stared them down. Kirishima then putting a hand on her shoulder as he looked at them, giving a wide grin that showed off his shark-like teeth, calling someone MLA slurs. Now that's definitely unmanly. Damn, it wasn't even directed towards Izuku, and he still felt that in his soul as Kirishima's voice was filled with disappointment. It would be in your best interest to leave right now. Preferably before I lose my grip on Mina, she really hates bullies. Kirishima's eyes were soul-piercing as he stared them down. His smile was gone, and somehow Izuku knew that was worse. We both really hate bullies. The trio of girls looked back and forth between the two groups, their standoff continuing as Izuku felt his own rage coiling inside him, ready to strike if these three tried anything. His own vision became tainted with red as he looked at them, his fingers curling into fists as he readied himself in a defensive stance, only for them all to stop and freeze as an alarm blared out, and a police cruiser pulled up. Well fuck, Izuku whispered as everyone dropped the combat stance as they were entering. The door of the car opening revealing a man in a tan trench coat who looked at their group with a resigned expression. Is something going on here? The officer barely had time to finish what he was saying before Hino began leaking the worst crocodile tears Izuku had ever seen. Officer, this villain attacked me and my friends. We were just heading home, and he threatened and attacked us. The rest of his fellow villains came out and threatened us as well. She gestured back towards Kirishima and Mina as she cried out. She's lying, the silver-haired boy, Tetsu, called out. We saw her attack, what's your name? Midoriya. Right, she attacked Midoriya and tried to burn him while he was defending our friend and himself. Her friends were going to use their quirks as well to attack them. I can correlate that. He know there has been bullying Ibarra for some time now, officer. The blonde added on. I will admit we may have threatened her and her friends, 
But that was only after she started spewing MLA shit about Greeny and saying he should have been killed as a baby. Who the hell says shit like that? They're all lying officer. The man held up a hand causing them to stop talking. The second car door opened revealing a man with a cat head stepping out of it. Sansa, I need three sets of handcuffs. The other man nodded, a slight grin starting to form. Of course now, who for? These three, the man began, pointing to Hino and her friends. For attempted assault with quirks, lying to police officers, and possibly attempted homicide for the ringleader. He finished as the other officer nodded. What? I'm not lying. Hino yelled. Miss, just stop. My quirk is called lie detector. I can tell when you are lying or not. Hino's hands were clenched as she glared at the detective. The freak broke my nose. That's assault. Izuku's eyes narrowed as he glared at Hino. It was self-defense, and I warned you to walk away and leave Miss Shizaki alone. All right enough. The man yelled out, everyone silencing. Here's what's going to happen. You three are going to come with me. I'm going to take everyone else's statements and you are all going to leave. Is that understood? The detective's shoulders sagged in relief as everyone else stepped back and stopped talking. Getting their statements was easy. Izuku answered each question to the best of his ability before he was released by the detective. He didn't leave yet though. Not without knowing the others would be let go as well. Ibarra's testimony helped them, especially as her clothing was singed and no one else except for Hino had a fire quirk. Izuku sat on the curb as he watched the blonde boy get his statement taken by the detective. This spot taken, he turned to see the copper-haired girl standing on the curbside. Izuku smiled as he looked up at the girl. No, it's open. She sat down, kicking out her legs and crossing them. The silence between the two of them was almost tangible as they looked at the street, or really, anywhere but each other. Izuku picked at his shoe ties as he tried to listen in on what the blonde was saying. Thanks for helping Ibarra. He looked over to see his curbside partner staring at him. Her eyes seemed to be shining and oddly familiar. She's practically my baby sister, and she hasn't been telling us about how bad Hino's gotten. Why's that? She frowned and looked down at her knees, thumbing at a loose string on her jeans. The bitch is well connected. Politicians, military officers, even some heroes in her family. Izuku groaned as he rubbed his forehead. The images of a group of fat cats beating their gums and downing scotch rolled across his mind. Oh joy, I love those kinds of people. Sarcasm rolled off Izuku's tongue as he looked at Hino and her friends in the police cruiser, rights read and handcuffed with quirk suppressants. So is it true? You're quirkless. Izuku looked back over to the girl, curiosity evident on her face as she stared at him. Izuku frowned. He should have expected this. Yeah, what of it? His voice grew rough as she raised her hands, eyes widening in realization. Whoa, it's not like that. I'm just curious, that's all. He could tell she was being honest. He didn't know how, but he knew. Izuku looked back down at his shoes, bright red with a single white star on the ankle. A call back to a popular pre-quirk shoe that was repurposed for the remaining members of a dying species. Yeah, double toe joint and zero quirk factor. Lucky me I guess, especially when I wanted to go to UA. Really, hero course. Yeah, may as well prepare for the mocking now it'll be normal. Well, I hope you get in. The girl's voice was honest, filled with hope and joy. Izuku froze and blinked. He must have heard her wrong. What? I hope you get in, the girl began. I seriously hope you get in, especially with how you helped Ibarra. She gave a smile and Izuku could swear he was feeling a sense of deja vu. Have we met before? She blinked at that, looking confused as she tilted her head. What? Sorry. He began, hoping he hadn't scared her off, because of course he would be creepy and scare off the pretty girl he would just meet. I got this feeling that we've met before. I don't think so, I could be wrong. Maybe we met briefly. Yeah, well my name's Midoriya Izuku, and thank you. He held out a hand. The girl smiled as she clasped it. Kendu Itsuka, nice to meet you. Do you suppose this could be an eventful evening? The blonde asked Izuku as the cruiser pulled away with the three girls. Izuku scoffed at the blonde while the sight of Hino and her little gang being hauled away brought a smile to his face. I went out to get a gym membership and ended up in a fight, I'd say so. He turned to the blonde who stood with his arms behind his back. The blonde gave a light bow before holding out a hand. Monomanito, thank you for your assistance. Izuku looked at the blonde's outstretched hand before shaking it. The blonde's dexterous and more graceful fingers felt odd against him. This was someone who was an acrobat, born and raised. Just did what anyone with a sense of decency would do. True, I hear you plan on applying to UAS Hero Course, I do hope to see you there. It would be a shame if a fighting spirit such as yours would be allowed to go to waste. He means you better apply. The silver-haired boy added as he stepped up. Trust me when I say it's a compliment. Also I'm saying you better apply. The amount of people who can actually hold against me in a fight is small. I wouldn't mind going a few rounds with you. Thank you. He didn't know his name. He had heard the others call him Tetsu. Right, my bad. He laughed as he held out a hand. Name's Tetsu 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 Tetsu. Izuku blinked as he shook it. The heavy calluses and light bruising around the knuckles felt far more familiar against his own. 
This boy was a fighter, he could feel it in his bones. You're joking right. Tetsu Tetsu smiled as he put his hands on his hips. Nope, I know how it sounds. It doesn't help that my quirk is called steel. Izuku let out a slight chuckle at the irony of that as he felt a tap on his shoulder. Excuse me. Izuku turned to see Shizaki with her hands clasped in front of her. I know you didn't have to get involved with Hino, but thank you. Your wrath and pride may be a weakness, but I do hope to see you at UA. Midoriya. Monoma sighed as if this was familiar for them. Izuku was confused. Okay, I hope to see you there as well, Miss Shizaki. He gave a slight nod to her as Kendo came back over from where she was talking to Kirishima and Mina. All right, Midoriya. Kendo began, holding out her hand. Pass me your phone real quick. Izuku pulled his phone out and passed it over to her as she began typing in it. And there you go. She passed the phone back over and Izuku saw it was filled with several new numbers. That would be mine and the rest of ours so we can meet up. Kami, she had a gorgeous smile. What the hell was wrong with him? Now I'm afraid we have to get going. But definitely call or text us to meet up. I certainly wouldn't mind another sparring partner. Kendu gave a wave as she and her friends began walking away. Izuku continued to look after them even after they turned a corner and vanished from sight. A scuffing sound of tennis shoes on concrete brought his attention back to Mina and Kirishima, both of them having approached while he was turned. Is it okay if we talk greeny? Crap. This would most likely turn into them yelling at him due to the fact he was lying about possibly having a quirk. But he never even brought it up and didn't confirm or deny it, and he would possibly lose them, and he would get banned from fair play? Madabro, you're muttering again. Crap. Also, we're not mad. Why would you think we would be mad? They weren't mad. This didn't make sense. People would always get angry when they found out about him being quirkless, and if they didn't get mad then it was the looks of pity and that was much worse. It's, it's never worked out well in the past. Izuku began. I mean I have my mom, and she's a saint for having to put up with me but, it's never worked out before. Whenever other teachers or students or hell, anyone, would find out about me being quirkless, their smiles would become a little more pinched, forced, sharp even. They would see right through you, not at you. A social piranha is what you could be at best and a practice dummy is what you will most likely be, and the victim of bastards like the purifiers is what you could be at worst. Once you're diagnosed, your life may as well be over. Izuku looked back to them, the growing looks of horror on their faces. So that's why I don't tell anyone, I understand if you. He was cut off as both of them wrapped their arms around him and just held him tight, almost afraid he would vanish if they let up even a bit. I could see you as a hero. Mina whispered into his collar. He could tell she was trying not to cry. I could see you saving people's lives, and to hell with anyone else who says otherwise. Your manly Midoriya, Kirishima began. I believe you can be a hero. I believe, I hope, there were people who thought he could be a hero. Actual people who believed he could be a hero. It was. Shocking. Izuku held his two friends close to him. Out of the corner of his eye he could see Alan standing nearby with a smile on his face as he mouthed I told you so while the sun began to set overhead. His phone was ringing, something that had happened more times than he could imagine since he met his friends. Izuku slowed his jog until he came to a stop at the old Dagoba Municipal Beach. Well, dump was a better name for it, especially when people began using it as an illegal dump site and filled the old beach with so much trash that you couldn't see the sand. It had been several months since the incident with Hino, and things were looking up. Izuku had been hanging out and training with the others as all of them were looking to get into UA, with regular days where they would just spend time with each other, quickly becoming close-knit as if they'd spent years together. Pulling out his phone, Izuku saw it was a call from his favorite redhead. Well go on kid. Jay began. Put her on speaker. Izuku answered, putting her on speaker for his friend to hear. Hey Kendu, is something wrong? Izuku could feel his nervousness creeping up through him and cracking his voice. Jay slapped his face and let out a groan while Sylvester began laughing. What? No, nothing's wrong. It's just, he could hear her sigh. We're gonna have to cancel movie night. Mina and Kiri are still at fair play. Tetsu has boxing, Nito has his theater club, and well. She paused, silence filled the line. You need a break for a night. I am so sorry. There's just been so much and I'm still preparing for you I just, I just need a night. I hated that I'm canceling at the last minute but, Itsuka. Izuku interrupted, his friend stopping immediately. Take some time to rest. You can't be wrangling us 24-7. We can reschedule for another night if you want to. An exhausted sob could be heard through the receiver as she seemed to break down. Kendu was far too tired for his liking, and he could tell she needed a night. Thank you, I'll do that. Ibarra sent me some meditation music she listens to, so I'll try that. Okay, good night Kendu. Night Midoriya. At the silence, Izuku ended the call before looking back up to Jay, the older man having covered Sylvester's mouth with a hand along with holding him in a grip while he was glaring at him. Really guys, is this necessary? She can't even hear you. I know kid, I'm fully aware, but someone. Jay gave a light glare to Sylvester who was busy trying to get out of the older man's grip. Was about to get a little too happy. 
You said her name. Sylvester, having finally managed to get free from Jay's grip, yelled out in joy. You said her name. I told you he liked her. We still don't know. Jay hissed. He hasn't awakened yet. Oh please, it'll be soon I just know it. Sylvester was jumping around, overjoyed as he pointed to Izuku. He'll awaken soon Jay, and then she'll awaken, and they can live again. You still haven't told me what you mean by awakening. Care to spill? Izuku had been hearing things like this for some time now, especially since the day at Fair Play. One of his friend's hallucinations, ghosts, would say something like this, something about an awakening. Frankly, it was starting to creep him out a little. Jay and Sylvester both looked at him while Izuku stared them down, arms crossed. Perhaps they'd be willing to speak on what this awakening was this time. Or they'd give the same answer or a variation of it as always. Kid, trust us, you'll understand soon enough. So the same answer it was. Izuku sighed as he threw his head back and looked to the sky. Look guys, I trust you, and I know you trust me too, or at least I hope you do. So why do you feel the need to hide what this awakening is? Izuku, Jay began, the older man pausing with that look in his eyes. Izuku knew what that look meant. It was one of old memories that you wanted to forget, painful tragedies and nightmares you couldn't outrun. It was one of hurt and he hated when Jay would get it, when any of them would get it. I can't say what I mean by awakening, but you'll understand soon. Izuku sighed as he looked around. He knew the others cared for him. Far more than a lot of other people did but still, it hurt that they felt he couldn't be trusted with this. Okay, I get it. He looked around at the dump, which was noticeably smaller than usual, and added in the dumpster outside and that was all Izuku needed to know about what was happening. Someone was finally cleaning Dagaba. Hey, you guys know that certain support items are allowed within the entrance exam, right? Of course we are. Izuku turned to see that Charles and Al had taken Jay and Sylvester's places. You're thinking of building something to help you in the exam. Well if I can, then possibly. Mainly though, I'm looking for a way to pass the time as my night just cleared up, and you choose to pick through a dump and to source your materials from it. Al added in, his mask once again granting him a neutral expression as he looked towards the dump before putting his head in a hand, an aura of resignation pouring off of him. You have your shots right kid? Yeah, of course I do. Izuku began as he stepped into the junkyard, carefully maneuvering around the massive towers of garbage that looked like they could come down at any minute. Besides Al, I'm not making anything overly complex, some simple protection gear should work. Izuku picked up a piece of metal sheeting with three massive claw marks having ripped into it. He tossed it aside knowing nothing could be made from it. Just a simple set of bracers are what I need, maybe some shin guards and then I should be good. He added on a cheerful note, picking up some old work boots. What do you think Charles? Is there enough leather here for me to work with? Charles was about to open his mouth, most likely to beg Izuku not to build possible armor components out of garbage when Izuku heard it. A slight grunt of exertion and persistence that carried through the illegal dump. Come on, break, free. The voice was tired, exhausted, and still pushing themselves. Impressive. Izuku followed the voice further into the junkyard carefully watching his steps to make sure he didn't draw any attention and startle the other person. A girl, he could tell the voice was that of a girl, and a bit familiar to him as well. Izuku took cover behind a scrap pile and looked to see a girl about his age pulling on a piece of scrap metal wedged deep into the trash mountain before her, the tower slightly swaying in the breeze. Izuku's eyes widened as he realized what was about to happen as the tower began to lean more towards the direction of the girl as she continued to pull on the scrap. Rushing out from behind the pile he was at, Izuku raced forward. He had to get her out of there before the tower came down. Stop. You'll bring the whole tower down. The girl? No. The brunette who helped him in the slime villain incident turned towards him as the scrap she had been pulling at broke free. The tower heaving before pitching towards the girl. Izuku raced as fast as he could. Blood pumping through him as he charged the girl and grabbed her in a bridal carry before diving out of the way of the trash tower, pulling her close and turning so his body hit the sand. The two of them lay there for a brief moment, the brunette blinking. I, um, thank you. She began, her voice slightly nervous. You can let me up now. Izuku blinked as he realized he was still holding her. Sorry, sorry, I'm so sorry about that. He quickly let go of the girl as she pushed herself to her feet. I was just in the scrap yard, and I heard you grunting. And not that yao grunting is bad it was just verl loud and the girl held out her hand. It's okay, no harm done. And you did prevent me from being buried in trash, so I'd say that's a victory for you. She smiled at him before her eyes widened in realization. Hey, I know you. You're the boy who helped me during the slime villain fight. You disappeared so fast that I never got your name. I, yeah, sorry about that. I didn't exactly want to stick around after the hole. You know, Izuku replied nervously. The girl snorted in derision. You mean after Slugger revealed himself to be a quirkest piece of shit that I should have yeeted into the sun if there weren't so many people around and outed you as being quirkless in front of several news crews? Holy shit, was this actually happening? 
was this girl saying all of this with a smile on her face? I, um, yeah, that pretty much explains it. Sorry about that. The girl put her hands on her hips and smiled. Don't apologize. What he did was an asshole thing to do. I merely reminded him of it. Though, I never gave you my name. You're Araka Achako, future rescue hero at your service. She stuck out a hand at that. Izuku gave a grin before taking her hand and shaking. Midoriya Izuku, hopefully first quirkless hero and expert at running into danger with little to no plan. She laughed at that as Izuku took in her appearance. A slightly ratty to the point of vintage NASA shirt and overalls were Yuraka's attire with a pair of dirtied shoes to finish it off. Her shirt was coated in sweat and grime and stuck to her frame, revealing lean muscle building beneath. You're cleaning the beach to build up your muscle mass, aren't you? Yeah, she began nervously. My mentor. Well he recognized me after the fight and believes I may have a secondary aspect to my quirk, or at least an evolved version of it that needs to be awakened. I just have to build up enough strength for it to happen. And even if it doesn't, then I'll definitely be stronger for the entrance exam. Plus, it would be nice to see this place full of happy families again. Izuku could tell she was lying. Not out of malice but she was hiding something. Most likely her mentor's name. Also there was a hint of sadness that was there for a brief moment at the end that she quickly covered. So, are you applying to UA? I am, how's your girlfriend? You mentioned her back there and, is she okay? Her smile was back, a real one. Himmy's fine. She's still on bed rest and is going in for checkups due to her head injury, but she's fine. She is getting time to paint more, so she's enjoying that. Iraraka added as she walked back to the junkyard, pulling a sheet out of her overalls and looking at it briefly. I actually have to get back home now, oh wait, before I forget. She pulled out a battered flip phone and passed it over. Put in your number, I'd rather not lose you again so soon. Izuku smiled as he took the phone and punched in his number before passing it back. You're Raka doing the same to him. See you soon Izuku. I'll have to bring you back with me one night. I know Hemi really wants to meet you. Your Raka called out as she raced back into the junkyard and towards her home. Charles. Izuku began. Yes. His friend replied. Did that really happen? Did you collect another friend? Then yes, that did happen. Huh, so I have another friend now. Exactly. Why is this so hard to believe? Probably because I just had you guys up until a few months ago and now I've put more numbers in my phone than I have in my entire life during those few months. I suppose that does make sense. I hope it does. Izuku looked around to see the night growing darker with each passing second. We should head home also, it's getting laid out. At least we're not picking through garbage. Izuku groaned at the grin Charles gave as the two of them went home for the night. They were pinned down, clods of dirt falling all around them, Rex on one side and Frank on the other. The shouts and screams from the battlefield continued to ring out followed by rounds of gunfire and the loud zap of an energy weapon. He looked over the trench side only to see the soil in front of him burst from a stray bolt. They were pinned down, unable to move, and he was on the other side of the field in that damn walking fortress of his. What's the damn plan, ha? Huh? Izuku was yanked from the dream and bolted upright in his bed. They were becoming more vivid, clearer, and he didn't understand them. Stepping out of bed Izuku walked over to his desk and turned on the light. A quick gaze at the Egyptian statuettes of Horus, Hathor, Anubis, and Osiris on the desk as he quickly sketched down the image of the new figure. The grizzled soldier in combat fatigues in a marked helmet, three bars and three verses that were upside down. A sergeant, what is wrong with me? Izuku asked the darkness as he returned to bed, turning out the light before falling asleep. Unaware of the new set of eyes watching over him for the evening, rifle in hand, 